All right. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about argon, um, in particular to ALCF. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so I was asked to give a, a short 20 minute or so talk. I thought it'd be good to give an overview um, of the ALCF. So I told about 50% of you will know what I'm talking about and 50% of you won't. Um, so the, the leadership, the ALCF is one half of the leadership computing facility. So DOE has uh, DOE Oscar, the Advanced Scientific Computing Research uh, area within the Office of Science, has three facilities, the Leadership Computing Facility, NERSC, and ESNet. And then the leadership facility is, is actually broken into two. What's one is here at Argonne and the other is at Oak Ridge. Um, it focuses on high performance computing at the, the capability level. So typically looking at resources that are um, 10 to 100 times more powerful than, than common systems. Um, it's uh, a gateway to scientific discovery um, and leads to, to, to breakthrough science and uh, helps the nation um, move towards uh, um, new breakthroughs uh, and, and gives us a competitive advantage. But really what the ALCF is, 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 is the staff. So we heard about the great Intel machines and, and we're extremely happy with Theta, which I'll say something about in a second. We're excited about Aurora coming. Um, we run Mira, but it's really the staff here that makes the uh, ALCF possible. Uh, we're roughly organized into three areas, one being science, and that's about a third of our staff that focus on, focuses on helping the users in a variety of different ways. Um, the operations team, which keeps the machine running, and our user support team, which helps users get on the machine, helps them get uh, educated about the machine, um, and helps kind of in tier one uh, support. So people often ask me, what does the ALCF do? Um, the simple answer is we deliver cycles. So we deliver uh, a couple billion core hours a year. Um, we do this very well. We have uh, overall availability of, of greater than 96%. Um, but what we really do is we partner with the scientific community. Um, our catalysts are part of our science team, um, work with users, and this is pretty unique within facilities. Oak Ridge has some things called liaisons. We have our catalysts. Um, they are in direct partnership with our users. And so they're domain scientists that know the science is trying to be accomplished, but they also have deep knowledge of our resource. And this has been an extremely powerful um, partnership. Uh, we do pro provide full support we have things, um, performance engineers to help tune codes. We have visualization experts to help analyze the results, help sometimes debug codes. Um, and what comes out of the, all of this is a lot of great publications. Um, I would also say that, and specifically you heard some in the last talk, we partner with industry, um, both in the development of hardware and software. So as a facility, um, our, our currency is ours. And we give that out in um, three ways. So our big, biggest allocation program is the Insight program. It represents 60% uh, percent of our available time. Um, the Oscar Leadership Computing Challenge, ALCC, represents uh, another 30%. And then at the center's discretion, we have um, the director's discretionary allocation. Um, and that's mainly aimed at giving users uh, uh, initial allocation to get started to prepare for the other two big awards, as well as um, kind of timely events. And I'll say a little bit more about the programs and you kind of see um, why discretionary allocation is a, is a good thing. So just a little graphical representation um, within the LCF, program um, between Argonne and Oak Ridge, we deliver almost 6 billion core hours of, of time 
over roughly 50 projects each year. So it's, these are large, these are large awards. Um, ALCF itself delivers slightly more than half of those um, via Mira. Um, a bit more detail on the on the programs. Um, Insight, as I said, uh, represents 60% of the award. It's a one-year award. You can request up to three years, but it's renewable each year. Um, typically, we have between 30 and 40, maybe as many as 50 projects. Right now, they're averaging at, at Argonne about 100 million core hours per award. Um, is there's two-stage review process. Internally, we review the awards um, for computational readiness. Are they going to make use of the machines? We want to make sure these machines are used as effectively as possible. Um, the second process, part of the, the process, is a, a peer, uh, scientific peer review. These are reviewed by domain experts in each of the, the areas, and um, scores are given in both spaces, and then the directors, along with the, the facilities, um, select the best. And so they really do represent the best in computational science at this, this high end. ALCC is um, a similar program. It also runs on a one-year cycle. It is uh, totally administered by uh, the Department of Energy. Um, it has between 10 and 20 awards, now approaching maybe 25. Um, some significant, some smaller. Um, they tend to be more high risk, high reward, uh, areas that DOE is uh, um, interested in a given year, may have special focus, um, and again, are, are kind of uh, a major part of the center. Finally, is the, the director's discretionary. These are short time frames, a couple months, up to a year, a lot focused on um, projects as they get started, but also to address uh, ones that need a timely award. So we've had anywhere from bird flu uh, modeling to simulations around the uh, Blue Horizon um, or Deep Horizon oil spill. Um, so again, kind of just responding as needed. The program itself, Insight, um, has continued to gain um, huge momentum within the, the community. It started back in, in 2004. Um, with just three awards and a very uh, modest allocation of about 5 million core hours, growing to 2015, where we were allocating about 6 billion core hours across 56 projects. Now, these projects are split between Argonne and Oak Ridge. Um, below, um, you can see some of the impact that they've had. So they're hitting the uh, best journals out there. People often ask about the diversity of the, the program. And it's a little representation just of Insight users um, in 2015. And you'll see it's a, it's a good distribution across um, the scientific domains. Um, we're seeing more and more growth in biological sciences. The computer science represents a small component there, um, mainly targeted at developing libraries and uh, tools. And then they use an Insight award to work on scaling. A little more diversity within uh, the ALCF. This is about the last year and a half. Um, we do spend a fair amount of, you know, even though the 10 billion hours delivered, less than a percent towards training. That represents a significant amount. We hold a number of training sessions, um, and you'll see a bit more uh, diversity here, a bit more description. So a, a bit on the science, and I think this is what's very um, interesting about ALCF. One of the things that I uh, greatly enjoy is the diversity in its uh, user community. And so we'll see anything from the very basic to the very applied. And so this represents some highlights from 2014-2015 uh, year. In the upper left-hand corner, um, we see uh, Martin Burson's work at Utah, where he's looking at accidental fires. So he's been a continuous user for the past few years on the machine, and he uses um, Mira at capacity 
to look at how we can uh, model and simulate um, accidental fires, accidental explosions. You move to the, to the right and we see Dave Baker's work at the University of Washington where he's using it to model drug design. Um, pretty big variance there. Um, down towards the middle, we have work done at, at Argonne in materials and work done at uh, the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana in superconductivity. Again, kind of representing some of what we would expect as a traditional workload on the machine. Um, the bottom two, the left and the right, are areas that I think are pretty exciting. These are things that are now just starting to come to um, the large machines like, like Mira, we'll come to Theta, we'll come to Aurora. One is uh, high energy physics. High energy physics has been doing computing for a very long time, um, but not necessarily on machines like, like Mira. And so in the past uh, year and a half, two years, Tom LeCompte, Tom Uram, Taylor Childers at Argonne have been working to port some fraction of the high energy uh, physics workload off the typical grid computing and onto to Mira with great success to the point that um, Mira now represents about 7% of the, um, the workload for LHC. And that's, that's a pretty big uh, portion. On the uh, lower right, it's work done here at Argonne um, on engine simulations. So we have this um, center that I'm blanking on right now. Verify, thank you, David. Uh, um, not enough coffee yet. But uh, Verify is a, a, a couple year old institute at Argonne that's looking at both fuels and um, engine design, both in the um, physical sense and the simulated sense. And so we've been doing a lot of partnering with them and they've been doing computer simulations as we see here, as well as physical models and then be able to compare the results. So this is a, this is a great new application of, of high performance computing and coupling with um, the physical world. I'll say a bit more about this uh, towards the end of the talk on areas that I think are changing for us um, and, and, and what's prompted that change um, or a result of that change is Argonne issued this summer uh, a data science program. So as we deploy new machines, we often talk about our early science program, getting science on day one, getting science uh, ready for the machine, and I have a few slides on that. We're also seeing, and this may sound strange given uh, big data everywhere, um, but at the high performance, at the HPC side of things, it hasn't been there. So we established this data science program um, over the summer. We issued our initial call. Um, and this is really looking at how do you enable data science at the high end. And so this is an example here of, of some work that we had uh, done last summer um, with one of our summer students that used images, data collected from the advanced photon source, um, and then kind of a standard tool, Spark, um, but now as a, instead of applied to kind of the business community, um, applied to scientific data. And it was very encouraging. It was, I think it was a good summer for the student. So we established this program and the call was really focused on one, is there science out there that could make use of this? And second, um, are there tools that the community has developed that are not really ready for HPC? And Spark's actually a great example of that. So it's not necessarily um, a very scalable solution. Uh, it's getting better and, and there are folks continuing to work on it. Um, so we issued this call. We had a very good response for a new program. This program gives access to our resources, the big machine, Theta, as well as some uh, experimental resources that we have within our um, laboratory for system evaluation. Um, and it's the bottleneck my, my, mine right now. I need to send out the announcement uh, acceptance letters, but they'll go out this week. We'll name two winners who will get time and a postdoc to work on this, as well as uh, a couple tier two who will get time and access to staff. 
And so those look for that announcement soon. I'm kind of looping back in to say a bit about what ALCF has. Mira is our workhorse. It's an IBM Blue Gene Q. It was deployed here in, in 2012. Um, it represents about 800,000 cores. Um, we have two other Blue Gene Q systems that help our users get ready um, and support kind of maybe some non-traditional workflows. Um, we still find that our users do their simulations and then need to do more computing on the results. So we have a, a vision analysis cluster called Cooley that supports our users. We have about 35 petabytes of spinning disk and about 35 petabytes of long-term tape storage. Um, I used to say Theta is coming. It arrived. Um, we've deployed it. Uh, it's going through its kind of acceptance test now. And we expect um, some of our early science users have been on it before the acceptance test started. Um, and then within the next month or so, we're hoping to get back to our early science users. Uh, for me, it was a, a, a very impressive thing to watch. Um, Susan Coglin, I know Susan's here, is the project director. She's done an outstanding job with the operations team on getting it installed, as long as Prey and Intel. But this thing was built in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Um, it left Chippewa Falls on a Sunday night in five trailers. It arrived at Argonne, a little convoy, on uh, a Monday morning. And by noon, the trucks were unloaded. By the end of the day, on that Monday, IB, or, uh, IBM Falls, uh, Prey and Intel were uh, starting to run some systems tests. Um, and by the end of the week, uh, it was you know, fully installed and, and they were, were running stuff. So um, it was pretty impressive to, at the rate at which they brought that machine in and stood it up. And so uh, I don't know if we're doing tours. No, all right. So you won't see it. But it's really cool. <laughs> and uh, and we, it does have its uh, skin on it now, which is in the upper uh, corner of this. And this is what it would kind of look like if you could see it. But you won't. Um, as we've done with every machine um, since Mira, starting with Mira, is we uh, run this early science program. So the community has all these benchmarks they typically run to evaluate um, the effectiveness of a machine. That just tells you what the benchmark can do. It tells you if the machine's working. Um, the science is what's the most important. So with Mira, we started the early science program. It's been widely adopted now. Uh, around the complex, and the idea there is that it will deliver science on day one. And so we, we issue a call to the community. In the case of uh, Theta, it was a pretty uh, quick call. Uh, we had six results, uh, six um, proposals selected, and these have been working with postdocs um, that we fund, as well as the, the staff, to get ready for science on day one. And these are the users that will initially get access to the system. Um, and those, those six are, again, kind of across the spectrum, um, very from the very applied to, um, from basic to very applied. Uh, we see things from Stanford, um, the SU2 engineering code, uh, Blue Brain Project, and kind of looking at um, computational models around the brain. Um, those are probably our two farthest um, away. The rest of them are pretty much related to the lab. Um, again, that's somewhat driven by the, the short time frame that we turned this program around. Julia Galli um, at the University of Chicago and her QBOX code. Um, uh, Ketrin Heitman and uh, Sam Habib with HACK. Uh, Alexei Kokloff with his combustion code. And uh, Benoit Rue with NAMBI. So these are a lot of these codes will be familiar to you in terms of uh, use within the community. And again, we've been working with these users for the past, past year or so to make sure that they're ready for um, Theta uh, and can start doing science on, on day one. Um, Aurora is coming. Uh, this is a huge leap for us. This is a, a minimum an 18x increase over the computational power of, of, of Mira. Um, 
a change in architecture, a change in software stacks. Our Aurora Early Science Program um, just closed. Uh, this machine's looking for delivery in 2018. So a, lo a bit longer partnership um, with the community than we had for Theta. Um, and I last checked, I think there was something like 40 applicants for the early science program and we're looking to fund about 10. Um, just to kind of give you a timeline of where we're at um, on each of the, the pieces, uh, orange is the Theta program and, and, and green is um, is the Aurora. And then finally kind of wrapping up uh, overview of ALCF, this is a summary of where we were at in kind of uh, the computational space. So roughly uh, mirror and theta are equivalent in size, difference in arc, different, differing in architecture, um, and giving us really a platform to get ready for Aurora, giving us some extra cycles that we can apply to the data science program. Um, and, uh, and to the community for maybe things like the Exascale program. Um, and then you can kind of see where, where uh, Aurora falls in this. So in my last nine or so minutes, I have a half a dozen or so slides to kind of talk about a bit about where um, I think the facility is going, maybe what would be somewhat different than our traditional um, traditional high performance computing um, center. So I, I do think it will be more data focused. Um, it does sound funny. I, I kind of make fun of the term big data because we've been doing big data for a long time. But it's somewhat on how you operate and think about that, um, that data. Uh, finally, I, I also think that interactivity and exploration is going to be uh, needed more. Um, Anytime I'm giving a talk in Chicago, I got to get Michael Jordan into the, to the slide somehow. So um, we're kind of moving from this, this thinking mode to a much more active mode. And along those lines, um, this is a, a, a tool that we use in house uh, called the Gronk. Um, and it represents the state of a mirror at any point in time. So on the left, you see the top, the top in both of them the state of mirror on what's running there. The left-hand column is what's currently active on the machine. You can see the colors. The left side represent the jobs and how much of the machine they're using. And this is very useful. And this is, you know, as a, as a manager, I look at this and then I can see that there's nothing on the machine and I can call somebody and ask why and I can understand a, a picture. Um, I think what's more of a note to the so typical facility is the right right hand side where we have this ever lending list of items queued up, right? So this is and I get this is the most hate mail I get. Well, I shouldn't say that. I have a long list of hate mail, but uh, hate mail is often about queue length, right? So I'm waiting in the queue. Why are there so many jobs in the queue? Why can't I why can't I run? Um, and this batch mode of thinking uh, very much is at the center of of our facility and, and most large computing facilities. And so that defines the kind of work you can do. So there is interesting science out there beyond, beyond simulation science. And Argonne as a, a DOE facility um, is home to a lot of these activities, um, to other facilities like ALCF, the Advanced Photon Source being one of them. I don't know if anybody's staying at the guest house. Um, across campus, but it's really there to support the advanced photon source and its uh, numerous users that come in to actually physically work on beam lines throughout the year. This slide here is um, the results of uh, uh, some work jointly between uh, the APS and the Math and Computer Science Division here where they were coupling MIRA to the simulation to do some real-time analysis. <coughs> and that's great in itself because they can look at their sample output and understand if they're getting the results they want. And that's kind of the, the, the pipeline that you see towards the bottom and the, the end results in terms of uh, the visualization. Um, but what happens at the APS is people come in, they do their simulation, 
they used to just take their data and go home. And if their sample wasn't in the system wrong or some other flaw happened or problem happened, they wouldn't know about it. And so beam time is very precious. It's much like CPU time. So users want to know what's going on. And now it's, it's more and more competitive. So they might not get another shot at the at, at, at data collection till sometime later in the future. And understanding that things are correct is, is really important. And this here, while we did have great results and they used about 180,000 cores of Mira, um, it turned out that there was a, uh, a cable and as the, the experiment turned, it would actually pull the cable out. And they would have collected that data, left and not known that and only had half the results. So from that standpoint, it was a, um, a huge win. But what did this mean within the context of the center? This meant that we put a, ever deadly word in place, a reservation, and we blocked a number of our nodes so that they could do this. Now, I would, as a facility director, say that that was a win still because we enabled them to, to get good results. We enabled their science. But what it meant is those nodes were not usable um, while we were waiting. And so, is there a way? In the batch world, this is common. So can we start to do things differently? Can we start to think about how we can enable this um, in different ways? The other thing that we've been exploring, um, and I have a postdoc now, kind of focused on this, is, is more to interact with supercomputing. And not changing science um, within the environment, but more of an interactive exploration, much like looking through a microscope. And so um, what Tommy's been doing is starting to figure out the pieces that have to fit together to, um, to enable something like this. And again, this changes the way we interact with the machine. So speeding up, um, things that I think will have to happen beyond this, this traditional kind of batch scheduling. We have gateways. Uh, the TerraGrid National Science Foundation has done a lot of work in this space in terms of enabling these, um, but they tend to be small separate systems from kind of the large uh, resource itself and how do you enable and how do you connect those. Um, one thing I'd like to do to our security guys here is talk to them about how I uh, share data. And so I say I like to share data with anybody. And I like to let them run any code they want to run without having uh, accounts on their machine. And that's the fastest way I can make a security guy fall on the ground. Um, I think there's other things that need to be done within the space in terms of proactive um, supercomputing and monitoring. We don't have a lot of resources available to our users in this space. Um, when I first started driving uh, the ALCF, we um, maintain our own scheduler, which means we write it, we modify it, um, we continue to develop on it. And I said, why? We can buy something. Why, why, why is this a good thing to have? And talking to the team and, and over the years, um, this is an asset. This is probably one of the biggest assets beyond the people that the ALCF has, that we have control over our scheduler. And so um, I have a list of things here that uh, we're interested in. We've been working with a professor at IIT um, and some of her PhD students to look at, at, at different opportunities. Um, this summer, we had an IIT student that actually started to work on with Cobalt to stage data, have it in place when you r run as opposed to submitting it, then moving the data in place. Um, we've done a lot of work on power aware scheduling and the, the benefits of that. Um, and there's a lot more to come. And I think this is a huge, huge resource. Uh, so automated analysis and visualization. Again, we've done some work with students here in um, kind of preemptively visualizing and analyzing results and then having the human in the loop at the level of evaluating that. So to quickly wrap up, um, people ask what, what we do. Um, we support science, we deliver ours. Um, how do we move towards the future? Um, and how do we enable the type of things I talked about in the last five minutes or so? Um, we control the evolution of our hardware, right? So we are actively engaged with Intel and Cray on Theta and Aurora. We were actively engaged with IBM on Intrepid and Mira. Um, and that allows us to somewhat control our destiny. DOE likes to try to 
put a damper on that, but um, that is extremely useful. Um, we d we're not afraid to develop software. Um, we you know, have our scheduler. We develop what is needed. Uh, the key thing is we partner with our users. We partner with the, the community. Um, and then we're actively engaged in, in training and educating uh, the future. So with 27 seconds to go, uh, hopefully I gave you a, a, a brief glimpse into the ALCF as well as some things that we were thinking about um, moving forward. So thank you. Questions? Michael Hebenstedt, Intel. Um, can you go back to your presentation on the <laughs> <laughs> on the cluster scheduler uh, output that you uh, the log? Yeah, exactly. You have hundred uh, percent usage here. Yes. How do you do that? Um, I have a great staff. <laughs> uh, no. So this is just a snapshot in time, right? So. There is a window, and I, maybe I was uh, lucky when I snapped this, this image. The machine is not 100% utilized. Um, you know, it's the age-old batch scheduling problem of packing. So at times, there will be holes. And it's actually kind of bad in the, the blue gene because, um, or at least on Mira, actually on all the blue gene, um, we have a, a, a smallest allocatable unit that happens to be a, a half a rack on Mira. And so you'll see little, I guess they're four by four squares that will be white at times as, as we try to get ready for the, n the next job. So this is, uh, I lucked out here. Richard? How are you going to do something similar with 50,000 nodes? Yeah, um, we have. Uh, and we actually do think there are some benefits to this minimum allocation um, uh, that we do on, on Mira. We don't know the granularity at which we'll, we'll schedule, um, but it'll probably be some minimal allocation size. Um, that being said, we are extremely interested in we already use backfill to kind of find jobs that fit into the holes that we just talked about. Um, this high prof this uh, HEP work, um, some work in, in uh, biology. We're looking at things that need or can make use of small times to even try to get, do a backfill like the backfill. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to, again, get maximum use out of the machine. but. You know, we don't have a, a concrete answer yet. All right, let's thank Mike. And